grab and go emergency kits. I'm going to walk you through the steps of building a custom grab and go emergency kit that fits you and your family. It used to be that the government said, get a kit for 40 hours. Then they said 72 hours. Now they're saying 96 hours. That's four days of supplies. In four days, there's going to be unique needs between individuals and families. And so these slides are to help you understand what you need to put in your kit to make you comfortable during an emergency. Why would you need an emergency kit? Well, in an emergency, it's unlikely that at the last minute you're going to remember to grab everything. It's unlikely that everything will be exactly where you thought it was going to be. And it's unlikely that you'll have time or the time that you think you're going to have to get everything you need. And sometimes you just simply are out of what you need. And so it's a good idea to gather it all together. So when I was young, we had <clears throat> the family home evening manual that you would read out of and have lessons on. And they had a, a few lessons on preparedness, emergency preparedness in there. And we had those lessons and we talked about having emergency kits and that. And we would talk about, you know, if there's a fire, go out the window. If there's an earthquake, get under a table, that kind of thing. But we never created kits, never did anything about that. Well, Imagine how we felt one morning when we woke up to our house on fire and our entire family was standing out in the uh, street barefoot and in our pajamas in front of the whole neighborhood. Um, that, that was the time when we thought, hmm, should have made those kits, should have talked about putting things by the bed to grab if there's a fire, things like that. So talk about it and also do something about it and have drills with your family about what to do when there's a house fire or an earthquake or things like that. And then actually work on the kits together. So make it a family project. It should never be the responsibility of one family member. Often it falls on the mom. It should never be the responsibility of just the mom because the mom isn't going to think of everything. So in the family proclamation, we're told that men are to preside, provide, and protect. So as a father, you should be thinking, how can I preside, provide, and protect over my family in an emergency? Women are to nurture. In the family proclamation, it tells us to nurture our families. How can we nurture our families in an emergency? And then you can ask as a couple, how can we prepare to meet our family's spiritual and physical needs in an emergency? And how can we work together to meet those goals? And always, always involve the spirit. Make it a matter of prayer. If you don't know what to do, if you don't know where to get the money, if you don't know what emergency to prepare for, always involve the spirit. And he will teach you everything you need to know. So let's talk a little bit about government and other disaster aid. Um, Government aid takes time to distribute and organize. It caters to the masses, not the individual. There are lines for aid and paperwork to complete before you can receive aid. The shelters that you're sent to are usually gyms, auditoriums, community centers, centers churches. There's very no privacy and very little security. There are rules you have to abide by. Um, families may be separated. They may put genders in different areas due to space or safety reasons. Um, there are certain possessions they won't let you take into a shelter, such as a firearm and, and, and weapons or other things that they don't let you take into those shelters. And then when the supplies run out, you're faced with unrest. So for those who are thinking, well, we'll just um, rely on the government here, are some things to think about. You know, government shelters are great. Um, they've saved a lot of lives. Is that what you want for your family? Is that where you want your family to go and what you want to rely on? Some things to think about. Now, the Bonneville County Hazard um, Commission created a hazard analysis for the city of Ammon. They did it for all the cities in the county. And this, <clears throat> is the hazard analysis for Ammon. So 
At the lower end of our risks are a civil disorder, riot, landslide, um, higher frequency, uh, but lower impact is extreme heat, um, higher frequency, lower impact is a lightning strike. And then you go clear up to something like a hazardous waste spill or a high wind um, event. I was surprised to see that uh, a dam failure wasn't as higher than it is. I'm relieved to see that it isn't. But you can see that a dam failure, extreme cold, winter storm, drought, hail, structure fire, um, things like that are all the more intense things that we need to prepare for, the things that might take longer for us to recover from, might be more catastrophic, things like that. So take a moment, maybe pause this slide and look over this. The next slide we'll talk a little bit more about our area and the things that we are at risk for. So on this slide, it's the same, some of the same information, but you can see that they've looked at more events over on the left side, you know, an avalanche, um, extended utility outage, things like that. And then they've given us how often this has happened. Um, so you can see I've put in bold the five things that seem to happen most often around Ammon, extreme winter storm, hailstorm, a high wind event, um, wildfire and structural fire. So you can see that in the US, the average home is at risk for a fire quite often. If you think about the lifetime of a person or you know, the lifetime of a family, your chance for a fire is 100% every year. So that's, that's a high um, probability and something you might want to think about preparing for. So questions to ask once you've gone over these um, charts that we've looked at, what should we prepare for? Should we work with anyone else, such as family, friends, neighbors, or should we rely on outside help, like the government or um, other civil agencies? How are we going to prepare for these things that we've looked at in these charts? So we're going to show you needs and priorities, and then you can decide the how and what for your situation and family. So for me to to hold up a product and say, this is a must have, would be about the same as me coming to your house and telling you, this car is the must have for your family. It may not fit. Maybe your family prefers biking. Maybe you want to bike everywhere. You just like to go light and have, you know, minimal problems, minimal upkeep, you, you like to bike. Maybe you prefer off-roading and you want a truck for your family. Maybe you're into a tank. Maybe you want a tank. Compare these two levels of preparedness or fashions of preparedness. Maybe you just want light. You want everything in a light backpack. You, you plan on leaving your home on foot. If there's a disaster, you just want it light. Or maybe you're hunkering down and you want a tank level of preparedness. So these next slides will help you decide which vehicle for preparedness your family best fits. So there are levels of emergency kits. Like I said, there are minimum, moderate, and maximum. And you get to decide what works for you. Maybe you want a minimum type um, water uh, filter, but a maximum type container um, to put your kit in. There are variances in every part of your emergency kit. This slide shows different examples of containers. Over on the left, top left hand side, you can see there's a five gallon bucket. Some people choose to put their emergency kits in five gallon buckets because they're easy to grab, they're easy to stack. Um, you could use it to tote water, you could use it to sit down on. Other, some people really like those for their emergency kits. Um, over on the right, you can see a child's backpack. They're um, school backpacks. We used to put our kids, 72-hour kits, in their school backpacks because it was obviously about the size that was good for them to carry and it was comfortable for them. 
um, a fishing vest, you that keeps the weight of things close to children's bodies or to your body, um, keeps everything on hand, separated. And in the winter, it's an, an added layer of warmth. Um, there's a rolling suitcase. When my mother was a widow, I had her put her emergency supplies in a rolling suitcase so that if anything happened, she could just grab it and roll it to her front door and either I or a neighbor that I had previously agreed with could come and and take her and her suitcase to safety. Um, some people want, a, like I said, a minimal 72 hour or emergency kit and they go with a fanny pack. So whatever you choose, whatever kind of container you choose, also think about how can I secure it? If we end up going to a public shelter, how could I secure it? So that's why I've put some locks down in that bottom right corner. Think about how to secure your containers so that if you're sleeping in a public area, no one can get into your things. So now questions to ask for this are what containers make sense for us in our situation? Should everyone have the same container? Should everyone be different? And who is strong enough to carry a heavier load than another maybe? And if there are small children that can't carry anything, which parent or maybe which teenager or older child could help distribute the child's or the infant's needs or the toddler's needs through their packs? So this is an example of our um, emergency kits. We keep them in the garage. We keep them wrapped in plastic bags to protect them from dirt and dust. I want to call your attention to that fluorescent card that's taped to the outside. We call it our grab and go list. I'll give you a close up here. So the last minute grab card, we've taped it to all of our containers and everybody has one. The, like I said, the kits are wrapped in garbage bags and they're labeled with everyone's names. And then everybody has a grab card <clears throat> in a little sandwich baggie that's taped to the container. So for example, dad needs to grab his backpack, his cell phone and charger, his personal items, and he knows what that means, his wallet, things like that. He is in charge of turning off the water, the gas and the electricity. And he's got to grab water bricks because we choose to put our um, emergency water in water bricks. He's also in charge of grabbing a large propane tank, the camping stove, and the tent. So you can see his grab and go things besides his personal items are outside or in the garage. Everybody else is inside. They have a zone that they're grabbing things from in the house. Um, someone's grabbing the safe. Someone is grabbing the first aid kit things like that. And we'll talk more about that. We also have our meeting place um, written on each card so that, you know, if your mind goes blank or maybe you've recently changed your, um, your meeting place, you know, you can say, oh, was it this one or this one? It's written down right on the card for you. So you know exactly where the family's going to meet. Um, we've chosen a meeting place outside, just outside the house, and then a meeting place if we can't get back to our neighborhood. Those are the two meeting places that you do need to choose. The items on your last minute grab card do not go in your kit. They're usually too big, they're used too often, or it's an act activity that needs to be performed before you leave. So these things don't go in your kit, but they do need to go with you. So this is um, our emergency kit, one of them unbagged. To, and so it's a, a hiker backpack with a wool blanket that's wrapped in a contractor grade um, garbage sack and it's tied to the outside of the emergency kit. So that's just one way, one way of many options for doing an um, emergency kit. So your questions now are, what last minute grab items do I need to list on cards for my family? Can other family members grab items? How old are your children? Um, are, are people mobile enough that they could go grab things or strong enough? And then along with gathering things, like I said, what activities need to be done last minute, like turning off the water and the power and the gas. 
So with your supplies, we have priorities. I was talking once with a friend of mine who's kind of a like super hiker, super backpacker, and talking about emergency kits with him. And I, I said, I have this giant list of things. And he said, oh, don't please don't overdo it. Don't overthink it. You have three priorities when it comes to emergencies. And they are stay warm and dry, stay fed and hydrated, and stay clean and healthy. So as we go along, we're gonna talk about what you need in an emergency to stay warm and dry, fed and hydrated and clean and healthy. And then you get to decide, how do we do that in our family? What works for us? And I'll give you some examples. Remember the rule of threes in a survival situation too. You can survive three minutes without air or in icy water, three hours in extreme conditions without shelter, three days without water, if you have shelter, three weeks without food, if you have shelter and water. So again, remember your priorities, stay warm and dry, stay fed and hydrated, stay clean and healthy. And we'll go um, work on stay warm and dry. So staying warm and dry means, it means shelter. That's one of the things it means. So are you looking at, like this gentleman in the upper left corner, just a tarp? Are you going to lay out a tarp and sleep under a tarp? Are you going to go with a one-man tent, a two-man tent? Or maybe like in the upper right, a family tent? Or you're going with your RV. You, that's what you plan for your shelter in an emergency. So these are just options for your shelter. Now, with all of these options, there are tools that you will need to have. Not all of them, you know, some of them may suffice or, you know, instead of a hammer, you choose to use a rock, whatever you'd like. But these are just some ideas. Um, at the bottom right of the list, you'll see extension cord. You'll think, well, in an emergency, what am I going to do with an extension cord? Well, someone may, around you may have a generator and they may be kind enough to let you use the um, electricity for a while or if if nothing else, it's an added cordage or rope that you could use. So think about your shelter. Will you go to a government shelter? If not, what shelter will we choose to prepare? And what tools do we need for that type of shelter? So you can pause at all of these orange slides, just pause, write down the answers to the questions, and your mind will get working and you'll be able to think what you'll need to to prepare. So the next part of warm and dry is light. So are we going to have a flashlight for everybody or a headlamp for everybody? Are we going to go with glow sticks? Do we have, um, do we need batteries? Do we have um, any solar lighting? This little Bigfoot light there is a solar light. Those are things to think about. Are we going to um, have everybody have the same kind of light? All things to think about when you're thinking about light for your warm and dry, dry category. So what methods of lighting will we choose and prepare? Do we want to avoid flames? Do, do you have small children that maybe you don't want any flames for lighting? No kerosene lanterns, no matches and candles, things like that. All flames, maybe you're going to reserve for a campfire or something like that. What tools would you need for that kind of lighting? Does the back of your headlamp need a little screwdriver to get the battery out, to change out the, the battery? It's, a, it's things to look at when you're looking at your lighting. So again, in the category of warm and dry, warmth. So this should be second in your kit when you're laying or it, layering it. First you want your shelter, then you want your um, warmth. You've got sleeping bags. What kind of sleeping bags? Are you going to go with sub-zero? Are you going to go with camping sleeping bags? Wool blankets are great. Like I said, we've got wool blankets. They're incredibly warm. There's the safety blankets or the mylar blankets, the emergency blankets that everyone thinks of when they think of a 72-hour kit. Keep in mind that those will make you sweat. So you, you, know, you don't wanna rely 100% on them and having a buffer like a blanket between you and that. 
is helpful to keep you from sweating. Um, down at the bottom, you see a hand fan. So it's not just warmth that we need to provide for. We need to provide for cool weather too. A battery operated fan or a paper fan, very lightweight. You can just tuck it in a corner of your backpack. That will help you in warmer weather. Um, over at the top, we have a fire starting kit. I made a video on how to make a fire starting kit invaluable in an emergency kit and every person should have one. You may even want to split up the supplies of the kit and put it in different pockets of your backpack so that if one pocket gets unzipped and things fall out, you still have some fire starting tools at your at hand. Um, hand warmers, foot warmers, body warmers, all great things to have. Or you could go, you know, full board and get a propane tank and a Mr. Buddy heater. It's up to you. But think about possibly getting an a fire extinguisher. They do sell small canned um, fire extinguishers that put out small fires. That's something to consider. Tools you might need for this category are like a hatchet, a saw, and fuel for whatever type of lighting you're choosing or warmth that you're choosing. So your questions for this category are how will we stay warm? How will we stay cool? And do we need any tools to stay warm or to stay cool? So write down the answers to those questions. Then in the category of warm and dry, we have clothing. It's huge. Put your clothing on the bottom of your pack. It's unlikely that you'll change clothes until you've been um, out in this emergency situation for a while. It could be that you would need to change them sooner, but it's less likely. So for cold weather, you want to pack layers. You want your base layer long johns, that kind of thing, mid layers, a shirt and a sweatshirt, a top layer like a coat and a jacket. You want gloves, wool socks, boots, a, a cap, definitely a hat because you lose most of your heat out of your head. So definitely for cold weather, think of how you're going to layer your family. And then on the right side for cooler weather, you want to pack cooler clothes and a sun protective hat. And then all kits should have at least one change of regular clothing, two for children because they're more likely to rip something, spill something, trip, fall into something, or have an, a bathroom accident. You need socks for everyone, underwear, a rain poncho, and sunglasses. Those are what I suggest for your, everybody has that in their kit. Um, put everything you possibly can in a Ziploc bag. We have rolled things up so tight and got all the air out of them and stuck them in Ziploc bags. Every, all of our clothes are in Ziploc bags in our emergency kits because if you have wet clothes then and it's cold, you have nowhere to turn for your warm clothing. Re -clo tools related to your clothing in your emergency kit would be a sewing kit or shoe glue. Those are things to think about. So what clothes will you pack in an emergency kit? Are you going to pack one season at a time or rotate clothes or pack for both seasons? Are there any extras or tools you need for cl your clothing um, segment of your emergency kit? Our family chooses to pack both seasons. We've got warm weather clothes and cold weather clothes. So no matter what, we're prepared. I, I used to try to switch out the seasons and then it didn't happen. And so in the winter time when I'd open our kits, we'd, there'd be sandals and shorts in there. And I would think, oh, well, it's a good thing we didn't have an emergency because we would have been freezing. So we just, we just keep them because I know me and I know I'm not going to switch them out. Also, you need to rotate through your children's clothing if they're in the age where they grow. Our children are all adults, so I know that their clothes are probably still going to fit them from year to year. But we still go through them every year to make sure that nothing's changed. So we've finished our warm, stay warm and dry category, and it's surprisingly, it's not a lot that you need, and it's it's fairly simple. So your next category is fed, stay fed and hydrated. So your first 
first, first, first thing in this category is water. Every level needs at least three bottles of water, and I'm talking like a Aquafina or an Arrowhead water bottle in a Ziploc in their bag, and they need a personal filter such as the one on the right. We prefer the Sawyer brand just because their uh, water filter, when it drops, and like life straw, things like that, the fiberglass in it doesn't break or the, yeah, it doesn't break and turn into filters. So we prefer Sawyer brand. You may have your own brand that you prefer, but every person needs three bottles of water and a water filter. There's also these uh, water, water filtering bottles that you could get. So you just put the water inside there and you just drink directly from the filtering bottle. The church storehouse, the cannery, LDS storehouse has filtering bottles for sale there and you can get them on Amazon. You can get the Sawyer um, filters on Amazon too. They're also at Walmart and the sports stores. So questions to ask, how will we provide for our water needs? How will we carry our water? How much water should we carry? How will we filter our water? And do we know where water sources are? So let's say you're, you're planning on heading to Bone if there's an emergency. Do you know where there's a water source in that area? How are you gonna carry water from that source to where your family is? If you need to evacuate your home and, and go to higher ground, say in a flood, do you know where water sources are around the area? A lot of people think, well, I'll just get water from the canal. Remember, people are very protective of their canal water because they pay for water rights. That's my understanding. So think about water sources and where you would get water in the area that you are planning to evacuate to if you need to leave your home. So staying fed and hydrated, we're gonna talk about food. So like I said, you could go minimum, you know, I'm working on using a fanny pack I'm gonna use um, beef jerky, a survival bar. I don't know if you can see behind that bag of beef jerky. There's one of those um, marine bars, lifeboat bars that they taste like a sugar cookie. It's like a brick and you just break off a piece every day and eat that. You could go minimal like that. Just beef jerky, survival bar, snacks, protein powder, and that's it. Or you could go moderate. This on the right is what most, a lot of emergency kits look like. Just things that are heatable over a fire in a tin can, or you can make with um, boiling water, or you know, just simple snacks that you can quickly open. These need to be rotated. Absolutely needed to be need to be rotated. So remember, am I the kind of person who's gonna rotate my things? Am I the kind of person that needs something more long-term? You also need to look at your budget. Can I afford the long-term, say, freeze-dried type things? Do I need to go more minimal? All questions to ask when you're looking at this. Do you want to bring fuel to be able to boil water to make oatmeal and make mac and cheese? All things to think about when you're talking about the food for your emergency kit. Here's another example of emergency food. So. This is a friend of ours. They've got their um, emergency food in a five gallon bucket and their water, they chose to use water bricks like we did. And they put a garbage sack down in that five gallon bucket and their food is down in there. So they have a menu all written out of what days they're going to eat, which foods for which meals. They've got snacks. Most of this is freeze-dried food. It's mostly long-term. Um, most of it just needs boiling water to prepare. You can see they've um, packaged things up by type of food. You've got, looks like there's dried apples at the top and down at the bottom, some uh, foil pouches of chicken. And they've written the expiration dates on the outside. They also, um, have a master list of when things expire. So they know that in February of 24, they need to exchange or rotate out all the boil bags of the chicken. Or you can ex 
exchange it or rotate it out a couple of months before so you could use it up before it expires. And like I said, each type of food is bagged up rather than bagging it by meal because they have a menu so they know for breakfast this day, then we get the granola and an applesauce. And for a snack, we get one of those breakfast shakes, you know, and so on. So this is less rotating. It's still rotating, but not as much as some of the others. So this is another way to go. If you know I'm not a good rotator, my emergency kit food will go bad because I just don't pay attention to that very well. You could go with freeze-dried food. And their, their dates, I believe I looked at one of these, um, I want to say it's like 20, 30 years, something like that. So that's one way to go. Another way, if you do want to do things that rotate out more often, just set a reminder in your phone. You know, rotate out six apple sauces or whatever in which kit or all kits or something like that. So your phone reminders are great for making sure you're rotating through these food, making sure you're checking on the clothing sizes in your 70, in your emergency kits. It, your phone reminders are a really big help with your emergency kits. So questions to ask, how many days of food do we want to store? The government says four minimum. What type of food do we want to store? How will we carry our food? Will everyone carry their own food or will there be a, a food in the main container? Does anyone have dietary restrictions to consider? I know for our family, we have um, three different types of menus because there are three different types of food allergies or non-food allergies. Um, so every you have to customize it, of course, according to your family. Um, we used to have all of our food in a main container when our kids were little and it was just kind of a rolling tote that we planned on just carrying with us you know our backpacks and then the rolling tote of food and then each child had snacks in their smaller backpack but not necessarily their main meals as, as we've gotten older and the kids have gotten older everyone carries their own food in their backpack and, and you have to choose what's right for you. So with staying fed and hydrated, there are tools that you need to have. If you're going to boil water, if you're going to cook food, you need a stove and you need fuel. Whether you're talking a Coleman camp stove or one of the Coleman hiker, backpack hikers, smaller stoves over there on the top left, do you need a pan? Do you need a pot to boil? Do you need a mess kit or are you going to use paper plates and cups? Do you need a spork? Do you need hot pads? Um, will you need propane? What kind of fuel will you need? Um, foil is always good to keep in your pack, whether you keep a whole roll or you tear off a long sheet and fold that up, put it in a Ziploc and use that. Foil is always good to have. And then a fishing kit. That's some, a great idea that I came across and I thought, that's ingenious if you're going to be near water where there's fish and you need to supplement your emergency food, a fishing kit is a great thing to have. So questions to ask, what tools do we need for cooking our food and maybe boiling our water? What, do, what will we need to eat this food? Do we need utensils or bowls, like I said, or a mess kit, paper plates and cups? Do we need any tools to to catch, trap, or hunt food? Are you gonna plan on relying on the land? And keep in mind that if you are headed for the hills for an emergency, so is everyone else. So keep that in mind. So we've talked about staying warm and dry, fed and hydrated. The last thing is staying clean and healthy. So clean and healthy hygiene. You wanna minimize your hygiene items as much as possible. Absolutely bring enough to stay clean for at least four days but you know you don't need mousse you don't need your um you know special perfume or things like that you just want basics now there's lotion pictured here do we want lotion yes do you want chapstick yes and i'll tell you why my 
my son balked at that. Mom, I don't need lotion. I don't have girly hands. You need lotion and you need chapstick because if your skin dries out and cracks, you've opened an opportunity for infection. And treating an infection in an emergency situation is never easy. So you want to keep your skin moist enough that it's not going to crack and you're not going to introduce or risk the introduction of infection. So lotion, yes. Chapstick, yes. Even if you are adverse to that, yes, you want them in an emergency. And then don't forget to pack spare glasses. If you wear contacts, you will want glasses because your hands will rarely be clean enough. You don't want to be packing out solution for your contacts. What if you lose your glasses or your contacts, things like that. And then women, don't forget your monthly personal hygiene, hair ties. There's going to be work. It's going to be hot. You'll want your hair up. And then if you're pregnant, think about childbirth related items. What will you do in that situation? Good things to think about. So questions to ask, what hygiene items will we pack? Do we plan on taking showers somewhere? They do have camping showers that you can use. Um, great invention, I guess. Um, black plastic bag or container that has kind of a hose going off of it and you hang that in the sun and it gets warm and then you can take a warm shower in the evening. Or will you do sponge baths with like wipes or a washcloth with soap and water? Do you plan to wash clothes? And then how will you dry clothes that are washed or clothes that get wet? You can, do you need a clothesline and clothespins? Do you need a larger container that you can wash clothes in. What will you do about that? Or do you plan to wash clothes during those four days that you're planning for, or however many days that you're planning for? So um, clean and healthy sanitation. Um, I watched a video by a woman who is a first responder in Utah. She's actually works for the government in Utah. And she made a great video about sanitation in a disaster. And she says, never mix urine and feces together because when it is mixed, it's one of the deadliest substances on earth. I've included a link here that you can watch that video of hers. Um, very informative, very helpful in knowing how to plan for sanitation. Um, that was my number one takeaway. So if you're going to take buckets for toilets, you can see over here on the right side, label a bucket for pee and a bucket for poo. Keep them separate because you do not want to mix them. Will you just use a shovel, dig a hole and go to the bathroom in a hole? Whatever you do, you will need toilet paper and you will need hand sanitizer to keep your hands clean and yourself clean when you're done. Um, over here on the bottom left is a female urinal, they call it, so that it's easier to go to the bathroom in the woods. Um, rubber gloves, something to consider when you're looking at sanitation. Wipes, something to consider. These are um, some of the most important things that you will need to think of and pack for in your kits. How are you going to handle the human waste in an emergency situation? And this is why I recommend that you watch her video. She will give you far more information than I could. I've already taken more than a half an hour here. This is a must watch when it comes to sanitation in an emergency. So questions to ask, what sanitation items will we pack? What about bathroom needs? Are we going to use just a shovel and a hole? Are we going to use buckets? Are we going to get a compostable toilet? And then how will we clean our hands when they get dirty? Whether it's bathroom or cleaning your hands before you eat or before you prepare food, how will you clean your hands in an emergency situation? Then um, another very, very important item in your emergency kit is your first aid kit. I recommend that each person have what I call a boo-boo kit. So band-aids, neosporin, some headache medicine, things like that. Some um, over-the-counter medications for teens and adults. Those go in a boo-boo kit, okay? Um, you keep it in a fanny pack or in an outside pack. 
pocket of your bag or your backpack, keep it accessible. Make sure you include an antifungal because you're going to spend a lot of time in your clothes and in your shoes and include some powder for chafing because you may be walking a lot. This is an example of some things that we have in our boo-boo kits, band-aids, sunscreen, headache medicine, antacid, cold packs, and rubber gloves, um, rehydration packets, gauze, medical tape, and then over in the right, you can see some over-the-counter medications. And I'm gonna zoom in on that and give you a tip for taking care of the over-the-counter medications in your emergency kit. So what I did was I bought a box of Dramamine, a box of allergy medicine, a box of X-lax, and a box of anti-diarrheal because they're the, those are the four most used um, over-the-counter items besides headache medicine like a Tylenol or a Motrin, things like that. I took the boxes for those items, I flattened them so that I could see the expiration dates and the directions. And the ones where I couldn't see what it was, I wrote the name of the medication on it. I put them on my copier and I copied them. I made enough copies for each person in our family. And then I cut out um, a, a portion of the pills in the box for each family member. So you can see I've got six allergy pills, six x lux six diarrhea medicines, two Dramamines, and then each person gets their own little um, the tube you can get at the checkout at Walmart of um, headache medicine. And then there's also a little thing of Tums in everybody's kit to kind of help with indigestion in case the foods that you've packed are upsetting anyone's stomach. And just like my um, the foods, we rotate through these. And so I have a phone reminder, change out the um, OTC medications for the kits. And because I have these photocopies, when I change the first one, I'm going to change all four of these so that I don't have to recopy and find those boxes and things like that. I'll just flatten those boxes on my copier again so I can see the expiration date and the directions and either see or write the name of the medication on it. And that way, no one's packing around a big old bottle of, you know, x lax or something you just have these little blister packs, a little sheet of paper, it fits in a little snack size sandwich, snack size Ziploc, and everyone has the basic OTC medications. And we also have a larger um, first aid kit for like trauma, that kind of thing. But this is your boo-boo kit that you keep with you and everybody has one. So questions to ask, how extensive do we want our first aid kit to be? Do we need to get first aid training? Do we need any first aid books or guides? Does anyone in our family have special medical needs to consider? So like I said, everyone needs one of these boo-boo kits. Um, if, you're, if they're old enough, they can dose out their own over-the-counter medications. Don't forget your prescription medications. Always include those in each individual's kits if they're old enough to dose themselves. Um, and then have a main first aid kit for trauma. And I would suggest that that goes with the parents or an adult child or a teen to carry the main family first aid kit because not everybody needs the big rolls of gauze. Not everybody needs a CPR mask. The things that you only need one of, put them in a main kit and have an older individual carry those. So your emergency information, you need to keep this accessible. Um, this is not your emergency documents binder. These are papers that should be in every single kit. You want a picture of each individual family member in everybody's kit. You want a picture of your family all together because if you get separated and you go to try and claim a child and people say, well, how do we know it's your child? You can hold up that family picture and say, see, we all belong together. We're a family. Um, you want a picture of your house to prove ownership of your house, a picture of your home contents. Now that is also in your emergency binder, but I also like to have just minimized pictures of the contents 
because it'll jog your memory and you'll remember, oh, this was in that room, this was in that room, that kind of thing. And then a picture of what's outside. Let's say we have a tornado. What was outside? Did you have anything that you want to claim on insurance? Those minimized pictures, I've minimized them and put them all on about five sheets of paper so that I just, I can say, okay, that's the bedroom, that's the bathroom, that was the family room, and remember generally what was in those rooms. So if we needed to make an insurance claim, it's right there. So, and then on your um, grab and go cards, your last minute grab cards, make sure you assign someone to grab your emergency documents binder. And I've made a video on the emergency documents binder that should help you and it outlines what you need to put in one of those. So in addition to these pictures um, and your emergency documents binder, on a three by five card, everyone should be carrying a three by five card that has their identifying information, their name, their age, medical conditions, family contact information. You could paste a small picture of the family to the back of it, things like that. Everything that Someone who found them or was trying to help them would need to know, you know, allergies, things like that. Keep that in a front pocket of everybody's kits. And I would also either laminate it or put it in a sandwich Ziploc so that it won't get wet and, you know, it's easily accessible. So ask yourself, what documents, pictures, and information do we need to gather? How will we protect these things? And should we make an emergency binder? I would say yes, I highly recommend it. An emergency binder can save the day in, in a house fire for sure and in a flood. Other things to consider outside of the categories, um, do you have any infants, toddlers, disabled um, family members, elderly family members? Like I said, I had my mom put her clothing, her special food, and her medications in a rolling suitcase. I took care of her shelter. I took care of her larger meals, things like that. Um, so I had to make um, accommodations for my mom who lived in a different place or a different neighborhood than me, but I still accommodated for her main needs in our kit. Um, do you want a weather radio? Do you want batteries? Do you want a solar powered one? Do you want a survival manual? What about walkie talkies and batteries? Do you have um, any thoughts of, you know, does the spirit tell you maybe you would get separated and need to be able to communicate with each other? For sure you'll want paper and pen, coins and cash. For sure you'll want games, distra distractions, and maybe a little mini Bible and Book of Mormon. Games and distractions, are very important. Um, in our family, everyone has a different game or card game in their kits so that we can all rotate through them. Not everyone's, not one person is carrying all of the distraction items. Do you want to carry maps? Um, let's say the power goes out, the internet goes out. Do you want to carry maps? Would they be helpful? And I do recommend an extra set of car and house keys in case you you know, lose them when you're out. You'll want them for your vehicle. You'll want them when you return to your home. And then a lot of people use the whistle and compass combinations. Would that be helpful for you? Do you, are you impressed by the spirit that something like that would be helpful for your family in your emergency kits? So questions to ask, what other items might be important to us in an emergency? How in depth do we want our supplies to be? Do we want basic? Do we want intense? Do we want middle of the road? Or are there areas where we want to be really basic and areas where we want to be really intense? Think about those, write them down and talk about them. So remember, with your emergency kits, pray about them and then personalize them. If you have any questions, please reach out to Chris or myself. Our numbers are in the Word directory and we would be happy to talk with you, do a Zoom meeting, even, you know, when it's safe to come over and just talk with you about your kids. So I hope this is helpful and 
let us know if we can do anything for you.